All right, Adele, over to you. All right, well, thank you everybody for uh, coming along today. Um, today, uh, Maria is going to be presenting on uh, the language of Kaket. Um, Maria, as most of you should know, uh, is a professor in linguistics and particularly in articulatory and acoustic phonetics. Um, I have benefited greatly from her work. Uh, she was my PhD supervisor um, and she's currently my boss <laughs> at um, JIPA, so where she is uh, the editor for the IPA illustrations. Uh, she has an extensive uh, history um, and is extremely well regarded um, across a number of different areas and most of her focus has been on a lot of the uh, Australian uh, Aboriginal languages like Aranda and Pinjara um, but she's also been working on languages of Africa and Asia as well. Um, so please make her welcome and I'm sure that we will all benefit um, a lot from her talk today. Thanks Adele for, um, you know, at the last minute being asked to introduce me, so <laughs> much appreciated. Um, okay, so yes, talking about um, Karket and um, this is work that uh, is very much um, in collaboration with Birgit Helwig, um, who's at the University of Cologne. And I just thought I would um, show the a gratuitous photo of me and Birgit enjoying some uh, wine and cheese in a Cologne restaurant. This is obviously pre-pandemic times, um, but it's really just to say that we had worked on an African language, a Nigerian language, um, Gamai, previously. And so when um, just oh, a little over a year ago, um, but, oh, or two years ago, now I've lost track of time, um, Birgit told me that she had completed um, her grammar of Karket and she was interested in doing some phonetic work, I just jumped at the opportunity. Um, and I hope you will soon understand why um, I thought that was gonna be very interesting from a phonetic point of view. Okay, before I go any further, <laughs> your photos here, Adele. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I want to acknowledge some co-workers on this project, um, Richard Bear, Adele Gregory, and Mark Gorelick. Um, they've contributed in various ways um, on phonetic labeling, on data uh, analysis and data interpretation. So I'd like to thank them. Um, I also want to say before there was any phonetic analysis, there were speakers of the language who were sitting down for many hours uh, many days with Birgit um, to do recordings of their language. Well, to, you know, you know, figure out what's going on with the language and then to do some recordings that we were able to use for the phonetic analysis. Um, and there were many, many speakers, but we chose these six ladies um, simply because they happened to record a decent number of word tokens um, and the quality of the recordings was good enough for phonetic analysis. So they're the only reason these ones were singled out. Um, but there are many other speakers who have worked with Birgit. Okay, um, Karket is spoken. So here we've got a map of um, the New, Gu New Guinea island. And as most people in this um, virtual room will know, um, it's divided on the left half is uh, West Papua, which is part of Indonesia. And the Eastern half is the nation of Papua New Guinea. And uh, Karket is spoken at the tip of this um, at, well, at the Gazelle Peninsula, and it's called uh, East New Britain Province, which gives you a hint of um, the colonial history there. Of course, there's also a Australian colonial history and also a German colonial history. So Birgit tells me that many of the people she works with have memories of German missionaries and so on. Um, many of you probably recognise the town, the name Revol up here. Otherwise, you probably don't know many of these towns here, but Karket spoken here, and Birgit tells me that even if you've managed to get yourself up to a ball somehow on a plane, um, you still, and you, you know, take whatever land transport you need to get to the bottom of this mountain, it still takes somewhere between four and eight hours, depending on whether you're a local or not, and how much you're carrying to make it up the, I think it's 10 kilometres up to where Karket is spoken. So, you know, it's a fair commitment in terms of, um, physical effort just to get to the <laughs> to Karket um, speakers and where they live. Okay, so, um, all right, I've never been there, full disclaimer. Um, I'd love to go, but I don't think it's happening anytime soon. Okay, um, so uh, Karket is a binding language. Um, it's a Papuan language. So Papuan basically means a non-Austronesian language. Um, so binding is a language family of about five or six languages five probably still living. 
Um, CARCAT has about 15,000 speakers and it has four monophthong vowels, six diphthongs and 16 consonants and it's a non-stress language. Um, I gave this talk at University of Toronto, this is a repeat of the University of Toronto talk, um, and I, because I ran a little bit over time there, I just took out any slides I had about what non-stress looks like in CARCAT, so that's certainly something I'm open to talking to people about afterwards, but for now I'm going to talk um, very briefly about um, the vowels and the consonants. Um, oh, sorry, first of all, I'll give you an overview of um, PNG languages, Papuan languages, I should say. Um, and then I'm going to have a little bit of a focus on vowels and a little bit of a focus on consonants, sort of a, a potted history. Um, and then I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about um, something in particular to do with the um, stops in Carquette, which is their voicing properties. Um, so it's really divided into two halves. The voicing is the second half and um, the first half is really just an overview of um, some particular phonetic features of Carquette. Um, Okay, dokey. So overview of PNG languages. So, all right, um, I just wanted to start with this um, little uh, quote from um, the Palmer tome on um, Papuan languages. Um, sorry, I just copied the entire bit, but I've highlighted, I've highlighted the um, important bits. Um, the New Guinea area probably has the highest level of language diversity on earth. Um, it has more than 1300 languages, um, probably so that would be about a fifth of the world's total number, belonging to upward of 40 distinct language families and several dozen isolates. Um, it's also one of the world's least documented. Um, in a particular survey, um, it's been suggested that the 27 least documented language families, including isolates, um, 20 are located in the New Guinea area. Okay, so um, just in terms of general, you know, knowledge of languages, um, this is a part of the world that isn't terribly well understood. Um, and when I was going to start working on Carquette, I thought, okay, you know, I better read what people have had to say about phonetics and phonology in these languages before I do anything more. And I thought I'd have to um, set aside a couple of days to do this because there's two major tomes on um, Papuan languages. There's Foley's um, monograph from the 1980s, and there's the um, Palmer Compendium, which is more recent. And, um, you know, as I said, I thought I'd have to set aside a couple of days to go through this. And to be honest, I barely needed a couple of hours. Um, out of about 300 pages in Foley, only 15 pages were on the phonology, so about 5%. <laughs> um, more than 1,000 pages in Palmer, only 25 were on um, phonetics or phonology, and that includes pages that were entirely taken up by maps and historical reconstructions. So really, um, there's not much out there, and I'll talk in a tick about why, um, but basically what people tend to be really interested in for Papuan languages is their morphology. Um, that can be quite complex, and they're really interested in historical reconstruction and in particular issues of um, genealogy versus language contact. All right. So what are the, um, I apologise for the next slide. There's just, I've gotten just a few quotes from Foley, but you can find similar quotes in other books. Um, so basically we're talking about languages that are really, really simple phoneme inventories, very small phoneme inventories. Um, so vowel systems with more than seven vowels are extremely rare in these languages. Almost all Papuan languages have inventories of consonant phonemes that are simpler than English. Um, and, and this is a phrase that really crops up all the time. Whenever you read any sort of grammar or, or anything on PNG phonetics, they'll talk about the wide range of allophonic variation. You'll get phrases repeated like considerable allophonic variation. This is just something that really strikes the, you know, linguist coming in from outside. And it really sort of befuddles them. Um, so, you know, one thing that really seems to, um, feature prominently in their minds is the interrelationship between um, t, the alveolar stop, and the liquid consonants l and l, so any sort of lenition processes, um, so that, you know, it's, um, it's really issues of what's variability in a phoneme and um, stuff like that is quite problematic. And I'm hoping that um, uh, in the first half of this talk, you'll get a little bit of a sense of why, and probably for all of the talk. Um, okay, and just, just as an example, you know, it, it has been claimed that um, the language Rotokas, I hope I've said that okay, has the smallest phoneme inventory in the world. Now, that's spoken on Bougainville Island, which is, you know, just part of PNG. 
Um, and so it's said to have six vowels, uh, sorry, six, oh, sorry, can we six consonants and five vowels. Yeah, so very small phoneme inventory, which could lead to a lot of variability. Okay, um, so just a few uh, details here. Um, I've already mentioned that I've been presenting, I'll be presenting data from six female speakers. Um, four of them born in the 70s, one in the 60s, one in the 90s. Um, so these are dictionary and field work recordings. So for the, for the phoneticians, this means that, you know, we're not getting um, the same word being repeated by several speakers, okay, because they're just recordings for the purposes of dictionaries. So, um, you know, this speaker said this lot of words, that speaker said that lot of words, and that's it. That's how, that's what we've got to deal with. Um, but the recordings were from about 2015 to 2016. Um, and there's the, um, uh, that's just a, a couple of references to um, some of the phonetic software that I used, again, for the phoneticians, but, but um, I really want to say here, um, just taking a little bit of a time out, um, I, I, I was mortified recently, I was giving a talk and I forgot to um, give the full citations for the software that I was citing. Um, and we're used to acknowledging our co-workers and language speakers that we've worked with and so on and so forth as we rightly should. But we very rarely acknowledge the um, people who are producing the software that we're using, software that we are using for free. All of these are freeware that I'm using. When I started my PhD, any one of these pieces of software, yeah, round of applause for the software developers. When I was starting my PhD, any one of these softwares was five thousand, several thousand dollars for a single license. One license meaning one person could use it at a time. And these are people who respond to my complaints about various features of their software and they improve them and they're doing it for the good, out of the good of their heart. They could be earning lots of money working for big technology corporations and they're not. They're doing it because they want academic work to progress. So <laughs> there's my... Um, there's my little bit. And you had to install from 30 floppy disks. That's right. All of that, you know, I mean, it was ridiculous. Uh, I remember the predecessors to EMU and the predecessors to R and they were expensive and, you know, it was prohibitive. Now anyone, even in, you know, relatively countries that are not relatively well off can use these kinds of software. All right? It becomes more tractable. Okay, so that was my detour. Sorry, I just really felt I had to get that off my chest. Um, <laughs> so, all right. I'll move on, Maria. Next slide. Um, okay, so now we can get on to vowels. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is the vowel space of CARCET. Um, it's really uh, quite uninteresting from my point of view. Um, I'm sorry I've written the letter E here. It's actually the schwa vowel. In, in the orthography, it's the letter E, but as you can see, it's just occupying the schwa vowel space. Uh, that's the, the monophthongs there, uh, the short monophthongs, sorry, on the left. And on the right, it's the monophthongs plotted with the, um, uh, sorry, the short monophthongs plotted with the long monophthongs. And again, this is from a phoneticist point of view, nothing to see here. We've got a smaller triangle for the short vowels and a slightly longer, slightly larger triangle for the long vowels. Okay, the double letters mean a long vowel. Again, really nothing interesting to see here. Um, and what I have, again, we've got the letter E, which is the phonemic schwa vowel in this language. And the ampersand symbol there is the non-phonemic schwa that seems to appear. Now, this is um, part of the problem that a lot of people working on Papuan languages, um, it just does their head in. And I noticed that there are two papers at ALS on something that they call a synthetic, but a phonetician would call an excrescent or, yeah, Excrescent is what it would probably be called these days. And I'll just give you an example of those in a couple of, um, yeah, in a, a couple of slides, um, what exactly this is all about. But basically, this is an uninteresting vowel space from a phonetic point of view. But when Birgit first saw this vowel space, she said to me, hang on, Maria, yeah, just go back. It, it really, is it really that simple? And I go, yeah, yeah, you got the phonemes right, it's fine, you know, that's it. And she just couldn't get over it. And I hope in a couple of ticks, a um, couple of slides, you'll have a bit of a better understanding about why she was so surprised that it was so simple. Um, so I'm going to show you um, just a couple of examples of diphthongs. Now, there are these phonemic diphthongs in the language, okay, six of them. Um, but how they're realised varies tremendously, as Adele will know, between speakers, between lexical items and so on and so forth. All right, so a tremendous amount of variability. Um, and I'm just going to show you a couple of slides of two words here, one that means walk around and one that means sing sing. 
And um, there will also be in that slide an example of this uh, excrescent schwa in one of those slides, um, sometimes called epithetic, sometimes called intrusive, sometimes called weak. I, politicians don't like those terms. Epithetic implies that it's repairing an illegal phonological structure. That's not the case here. Um, excrescent is really talking about, um, well, I'll say in the tick what it's talking about, what I think is going on here. Oops, oh, I've managed to click onto the next slide. There we go. So this is one of the words. Um, and have a listen to it. I will play it. Um, right, let's go. Asli, asli. I'll play it again. Now, that last vowel in the word is a diphthong. Asli, asli. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds to me very similar to just a high front vowel, close enough to high front vowel, a cardinal one. Okay, but it is phonemically a diphthong. What you're also seeing here is this ampersand. This is um, the excrescent schwa. Now, if you were to compare this schwa vowel, this excrescent schwa with a phonemic schwa in the language that speakers say exists, they have the same duration, duration and you saw on a previous slide, they, they occupy exactly the same part of the vowel space. So phonetically, you could not distinguish them, except that the speakers are telling you that one of them there is there and the other isn't. Okay, so this is part of the problem that, you know, someone coming in trying to learn the language is going to struggle with if they speak a language like English. But I think that these are simply just excrescent vowels. Um, the speakers of Germanic languages are very used to coupling their um, co consonantal gestures very tightly. So meaning that um, before you finish the first consonant, you've already started the second consonant so that there's a lot of overlap between those two consonantal gestures. Whereas other languages like Georgian is the classic example, but I guess Berber as well is another one. Um, you, you finish your first consonant and then you start your second consonant and there's a gap in between. So often these excrescent vowels are very high in the vowel space. So they're really close to being consonants. Um, and their place of articulation, more front or back, really depends on the consonantal identity. And, um, and here, this is showing up in a, a very typical environment for these kinds of excrescent vowels. Um, you know, it's next to a liquid. Sorry, you can't see the RL there, the retroflex flap being labelled. Um, and it's also, you know, if alveolar fricative is another common environment for these to come out. But sonorants, liquids, they come out there. Um, and also S is another one. Uh, S for Sierra, alveolar or fricative. So anyway, um, but you can see that, you know, if you're a non-native speaker, this can be a bit confusing. And if you're trying to count syllables, for instance, you know, it becomes tricky. Um, so yeah, I, I think I did, we should do some psycholinguistic studies asking speakers um, what, how many syllables they think are in these words. So, okay, next. I always do that. Okay. Um, this is the next word. I'll just get a play it for you. Again, this one has a diphthong in it. White mut. White mut. I'll play it again for you. Hang on now. I will try to play it again for you. White mut. White mut. So clearly more of a diphthong realization. Okay. So these are both the same phony. I would hear one as a more clear diphthong I, whereas the previous one I would hear a little bit more clearly as a monophthong E. Okay, so this kind of variability in even the vowels is um, going to be a, a problem from, you know, uh, yeah, an external linguist point of view. Okay, so um, that's white uh, mood. Where's that? Sorry. White mood. Sorry, moving on to consonants now. Um, and I've just realised that I have no idea of the time. Okay, that's fine. I've got my put my phone there. I should have worn a watch. Consonants. Okay, so this is the consonant inventory of um, Carquette. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, well, there we go. It is what it is. You can see it. Um, I've highlighted here the letter Q. I'm going to call this sound Q. V um, Birgit put it as a vela fricative in her phoneme inventory simply because she had to choose something. Um, but I'm going to keep calling it Q for reasons that I hope will become clear to you. There are other aspects I could focus in on in this consonant inventory. I could talk a little bit about this retroflex flap. I could talk about um, V for Victor here, um, but I, I just, you know, won't for reasons of time. Um, and But I'll be focusing on other bits of the inventory later on when I talk about voicing. 
So um, I'm just going to focus on Q. We're going to look at what is the problem with this variability in Q. Okay, if you go and read grammars, if you look at grammars from different language, uh, sorry, for the same language written by different people, say the missionaries and then the modern day linguists, one will use K for Kilo, the other will use Q for Quebec. So that's already telling you they're hearing differences in whether it's more uvula or vila. Okay. Um, Birgit in her grammar, you know, it sometimes uses the palatal symbol as an allophone. All right. So there we go. We're already going to palatal. Um, and so there's a lot, of, this is a sound that is represented in different ways in different sources for the same language, okay, which is why I thought I'd better focus in on it because I could tell it was a problem and listening to the database, I could see why Birgit was struggling with it. Okay. Um, and just for your, this is sort of for your information, I'm used to looking at languages like Aranda that are really quite crowded um, in, you know, this um, coronal region of the consonant space. So, you know, this is a, a more, in a sense, a more crowded phone, consonant phoneme inventory compared to say Carquet up here. All right, so I just wanted to tell you that I'm really, I was really used to thinking about how a sound's constrained in their variability um, to avoid them encroaching on other consonant property, if you like. You know, if I go too far forward, I'll start sounding like another consonant, for example. So I was used to thinking this way in languages like Aranda and suddenly dealing with Carquet where, you know, um, consonants seem to have a lot more free reign in what they can do. This, I thought this was a little bit of a challenge. So um, I was up for it. And yep, here we go. So that's why I was keen to work on a Papuan language because I used to read a lot of grammars when I started at Latrobe. Um, you know, people who are working on Papuan languages and I'd read the phonology chapters and I'd think, well, you know, how hard can it be? You can't see the wood for the trees, you know, it's not that complicated. And so, um, you know, I really wanted to get a sense of, you know, what are the problems? Why are people finding it so difficult? So, okay. All right, so I need to explain this, um, some of these charts to people. Um, it won't be obvious. Now, this is, um, what I've done is I've found, I've put together on, okay, we've got the letter Q in the middle of each of these, the sound we're interested in. And I plotted it next to two sonorant sounds, a liquid and a nasal and also next to two more fricative sounds, okay, the alveolus and V for Victor might be more fricative, might be more approximate, don't worry. Yeah, we'll see. Um, and each one of these four plots is just a slightly different harmonics to noise ratio, okay. Um, it's up to, um, this one here is up to 500 hertz, this one is up to 1500 hertz, this one's up to 2500 hertz, and this is the harmonics to noise ratio up to 3,500 hertz. So they're just measures of, if you've got a, you know, more noise in the spectrum, more noise in the signal or less noise in the signal. And that'll tell you, is it a more fricative sound or is it a more sonorant sound? So a more sonorant sound would have a more periodic element to the signal, okay? Whereas a more fricative sound would have a more noisy element to the signal, okay? And they're just looking at this information in different frequency bands. I could have only shown you one, but um, I just put them all here because why not? Um, and what I want you to notice is that in any one of these bands, Q, two things, Q is patterning somewhere in between the sonorants and the fricatives. Sometimes it's patterning more with the fricatives, sometimes more with the sonorants, sometimes in between. And importantly, it's also showing more variability than the other sounds, okay? So it's varying a lot in whether it's more fricative-like or whether it's more sonorant-like, glide-like, glide-like, let's say glide, alternating between a, a fricative and a glide here, okay? Um, and this is a plot of F1 and F2, the first and second formant, taken at the midpoint of these um, various sounds. I haven't plotted um, the alveolar fricative, S for Sierra here, because it's really a bit tricky to measure formants for those kinds of sounds. And you know, I acknowledge the phoneticians here that I'm probably comparing apples and oranges to an extent, uh, measuring formants in these kinds of um, different uh, consonantal categories. But again, what I want you to notice is how much more variability there is in Q, both in F1 and in F2, okay? Um, and I would see F1 as telling me whether the Q is more velar or more uvular. And I would see F2 as telling me whether the Q is more velar or more palatal. 
Okay, so this is a sound that is clearly varying between uvula, viola, palatal. And, you know, I'm sure Adele will confirm the auditory impressions are very much along those lines. Okay, the variability is there from an auditory perspective. So, um, and just before I, I throw an idea at you, I just want to, don't want to overwhelm anyone, but the, all this is is the same data as you've already seen, but um, plotted uh, for individual speakers. So um, the top, so by row is the different harmonic measures, okay, and the columns are different individual speakers, okay. And so if, even when you go down to the level of the individual speaker, you will see some speakers will, um, okay, so this speaker, the cue patterns a little bit more with the fricative, this speaker, the cue pattern patterns a little bit more with the, um, the sonorants, okay, the liquid and the nasal, all right. And again, for any individual speaker, you'll just see that there's a lot more variability in the cue, okay, than in the other sounds. So it's true within speakers and it's true across speakers as well. All right. Um, and this is the same thing, F1 and F2. Top row is F1, bottom row is F2, and the columns are just different speakers. If you look at any one speaker, Q is the most variable, okay. So um, I just wanted to reinforce that question of... Um, intra versus inter speaker variability. And I just want to end this consonant session by um, throwing an idea at you. Is what matters not the place of articulation of Q, but the fact that it's the most back consonant in the consonant space. Um, so really, it, you know, it can go further back. It's not going to interfere with anything. It's not going to pose a problem. Um, and, you know, often we're concerned with um, how can we constrain variability in speech? How do we describe the limitations? But what happens if there's free reign? If you've got a relatively small consonant system, you know, what are the limitations of the variability? You know, is it the back one that's allowed to vary a lot and, you know, not anything in between? Um, I ask if there are similar observations for V for Victor. Is that something that's allowed to vary? That's a sound that actually varies a fair bit between a fricative and a glide in English. So um, is that a sound that is allowed to vary? Um, from, you know, that sort of biomechanical planning perspective. Um, yeah, so anyway, they're just questions. I think they're the sort of questions that um, we can set, find some answers to in uh, Papuan languages. So, yeah. Alrighty, so yeah, going well for time. Um, I will uh, now say something about voicing in uh, PNG, uh, sorry, in Carcat in particular, sorry. Um, and so this time here, here we're back to our consonant inventory um, and we've got, a, I've highlighted in red the sounds I'm going to be focusing on now. In particular, I'm focusing on the voice stops, the voice plosives, okay. Um, and actually, I listened back to um, a recording I did of me saying these sounds and I realised that I, I was saying the voice, voice stops as the English voiceless and aspirated and I was saying the voiceless stops as the English voiceless aspirated. So I'm not going to say them because I'll say it in the English way. Um, but the voice stops are properly voiced and the voiceless stops are voiceless unaspirated. Okay. And I'm going to be comparing those sounds to the um, nasal consonants of the language. And hopefully it'll make sense to you soon why I'm doing that. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, yes, there is a palatal nasal in the language. It's a low lexical frequency. That's, yeah. But in case you're wondering. Um, okay, so why am I worried about voicing? Well, Birkett in her grammar describes the voice stops of Carcat as being pre-nasalised, okay? But um, in our phonetic labelling of the database, we only found about half of the voice tokens were being labelled as pre-nasalised. The rest were just being labelled as not being pre-nasalised, okay? And the issue of pre is something that when you read the grammars of PNG languages, it crops up all the time. They get very worried about it. Is, is this, you know, group of consonants pre-nasalised or not? It's a lot of a point of considerable interest. And the reason for that, and I'm sorry for the phrasing of this last bullet point, um, the presence of phonemic pre and also the presence of a voicing contrast between non pre stops is thought to be indicative of oceanic languages in island Melanesia, island Melanesia including... Um, you know, the New Guinea Island and, and the islands to the right, like Solomon Islands and stuff like that. Um, and their presence in Carquette, which is a Papuan language, is usually attributed to language contact. Okay. So Papuan languages mean non-Austronesian. Oceanic languages are a, a group of 
so oceanic languages are a group of Austronesian languages and I'm, I am talking well and truly beyond my expertise here so I hope I haven't said anything silly but um, so this is really something that's been a point of interest okay um, so yeah so I was just really keen to get down into the nitty-gritty of this because sometimes the nasalization is pre-nasalization isn't obvious so I was really wanting to explore this from, from a phonetic point of view I thought it was uh, worth going to so um, I'll be presenting for you today 1540 tokens um, that includes about 360 voiceless stops about 380 voiced stops and about 700 nasal phonemes proper. And the voice stops are in pink. Um, here they are, um, that's the phonemic, but they are split in the plots that I'll be showing you, they're split into about 200 voiced tokens and about 170, so voiced non-prenasalized tokens and about 170 prenasalized tokens, okay? So, um, now, for your information, phoneticians, word final tokens are excluded. The voice stops cannot occur, uh, syllable final position. Uh, initial voiceless stops are included due to their duration measurement problems. Um, uh, and also FYI, um, most voice stops that are not pre-nasalized are part of clusters. So about, um, yeah, so that's a fair proportion. Um, so yeah, clusters have a slightly, yeah. And, um, and just harking back to the point I made a lot earlier, there's a total of 440, about 440 different words included in this data, which is about 270 words that include stops and about 320 words that include um, nasals. So that's a lot of lexical variability that goes into uh, these results. Okay, um, and I'm gonna play you, just so you know how we went about labeling things as uh, voice or not. Um, I'm gonna play you a word that means hit or knock iterative um, and I apologize there's a bit of noise at the beginning of this uh, sound file uh, but then you'll hear her say the word the first time we labeled as it as not being pre-nasalized and the second time as yes being pre-nasalized so have a listen dun, 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 dun. and I'll play it again and you can um, close your eyes and have a listen first one is not pre-nasalized the second one is pre-nasalized Dindle, dindle, dindle. Okay, so that's fairly subtle, I think, um, but this is actually one of the more clear cut tokens. So sometimes it's, you know, a, an element of perception does go into it, but um, what are the characteristics? The non pre nasalized one, yes, it's got very strong voicing, yes, um, but there's no, not really a clear evidence of form and structure, and certainly in the time waveform, we haven't got much energy. Um, by contrast, the one that is pre-nasalized, we've got evidence of a clear form and structure, and um, there is a fair bit of energy in that time waveform. Okay, so that's, um, yep. That, oh, there it goes again. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, oh, I've got to learn how not to do that. Um, yeah, so that's just to give you an idea. All right, now um, I threw a whole lot of measures at this. Um, and I'll just present for you today the ones that are in a slightly darker colour. All right. Um, but, you know, it's all telling the same story, which you'll see. Okay, so before I uh, do anything else, I'll just show you good old duration measures. You'll be looking at a few plots that look like this. Um, there's uh, marking according to place of articulation is colour. So red is bilabial, um, green is alveolar, blue is velar. Um, the first group is the voiceless consonants. Uh, the last group is the nasal phonemes proper. Um, and the middle group, this one is the non pre nasalized voice stops. And this one is the pre nasalized voice stops. Okay. Now, this is duration not including the pre nasalized portion. All right. Keep your eye on these three pre nasalized stops. Um, what's going to happen to them as I add? the pre-nasalization. Ah, oh, no, Maria, come. There we go, sorry. I'll alternate between them again. You're keeping your eye on these three here. Oh, again, sorry. Hope you can see that the duration, uh, total duration is obviously increased when you add the pre-nasalized portion. Um, and it becomes more comparable to the duration of those um, uh, voiceless stops. Now, historically in the language, Birgit tells me that they were geminate, um, the voiceless stops. 
Um, and as I said, those voice stops that do not have prenasalization are likely to be part of consonant clusters. So their duration is probably going to be a bit shorter anyway. So clearly, um, you know, the purpose of this prenasalization is to somehow increase the total duration of that voice stop. Okay, so that's not a surprise. Um, Let's have a look at this RMS energy. Now, this is just a root mean square energy, just a measure of total energy. Um, and this is plotted across normalized time, across the token. Um, and this time, it's a slightly different plot, um, you'll, but you'll see a few like this. The unvoiced tokens are in, unvoiced uh, stops are in green at the bottom. Um, and that's good. That's what we expect them to be. They don't have much energy. Um, the nasal phonemes proper are in brown at the top. That's good, that's where we want them to be. They should have a lot of energy. Um, and then the voice stops are down here, non prenasalized and then the light blue here is um, the prenasalized stops. And you can see that they're patterning somewhere in between the nasal phonemes proper and the voice phonemes with a drop off in energy. So we saw that in the spectrograms. Okay, and now we're back to um, the kinds of plots we were looking at before. Here's our voiceless stops, not much energy, that's good. Nasal phonemes, yes. Lots of energy. This is just the mean RMS, sorry, across the whole token. Um, and these are just box plots to just show you a little bit of the distribution breaking down by place of articulation. Um, and what I really want to alert you to is this um, uh, place of articulation effect for the voice, so prenasalized voice stops. Um, I hope you can see that the um, prenasalized vela is patterning much more with the um, nasal phonemes proper and the um, prenasalized bilabial is patterning a bit more with those um, non-prenasalized stops. So this is um, a pattern we're gonna be seeing again and again. All right, so, um, and this is energy ratio. So this is a ratio of energy in a slightly lower frequency band, 100 to 350 Hertz, versus a slightly higher frequency band, 350 to 5500 Hertz. Um, and you can see that um, there's, uh, Again, we've got this place effect. Okay, so one is your crossover point. One means uh, if it's more than one, it means that there's more energy in that lower frequency band. And that's the case for the bilabials here, bilabial voice stops. Whereas if the energy is less than one, it means you've got a bit more energy in your, um, if the energy ratio, sorry, is less than one, uh, you've got a bit more energy in your higher frequency band. And that's what we're seeing happening with the um, velas. So um, what this suggests to me, so as soon as you have any sort of nasal leakage, um, you tend to see a dampening of the first formant in the lower frequency region. And so when there's a dampening, it's, you know, it's flattened out and it's spread, um, the energy is spread. And that there, as an effect, it has an effect of thereby, in comparison, emphasizing the higher frequencies. Okay, so this is telling me, and, and sure enough, you know, the nasals are generally less than one, meaning they've got a little bit more energy in those higher frequencies because the energy is being dampened in the lower frequency and spread outwards. Um, so again, we're seeing that um, the velar is patterning with the nasals. Um, yep. And this is something called the strength of excitation. It's a measure of vocal fold. Um, uh, the strength of the vocal fold pulsing. Um, and again, you know, we've got the voiceless consonants down the bottom here, which is where they should be, the nasal consonants at the top, which is where they should be too. And once again, we've got the pre-nasalized patterning in between the nasal phonemes proper and the um, voiced stops without pre-nasalization. Okay, so they really are patterning in between. And again, um, breaking down to... Um, a place of articulation, you might not see this straight away, but um, the velars have a little bit less um, strength, lower strengths of excitation than the bilabials or the alveolars. So um, what's probably going on here, um, as the phoneticians know, is that um, the very rapid pressure buildup above the glottis at the velar place of articulation impedes vocal fold vibration um, and and of course that explains the typological rarity of um, velar voice velar stops um, simply it's hard to maintain voicing at the velar place of articulation so um, this is telling us that yes the velars are special in this respect um, so it's all about voicing being maintained 
Um, this is something called Kepstrel peak prominence. It's another harmonics to noise ratio measure, okay? It measures the relative amount of noise in the signal versus the periodic component in the signal, okay? Um, and higher values, um, yeah, so the um, high value the, for the nasals here means it's a relatively um, modal uh, voice source. It's got um, a relatively high periodic component to it. Um, and then the, the stops are down the bottom here. Okay, so um, they haven't got quite as much of a periodic component to them. And once again, the pre-nasalized voice stops are patterning in between. Okay. Um, and when we break this down again by place of articulation, um, once again, we get this clear place effect in those pre-nasalized stops. The voice stops are patterning with the nasal, sorry, the velar pre-nasalized voice stops are patterning with the nasal phonemes proper. And the um, bilabial pre-nasalized voice stops are patterning with the voiced, non-pre-nasalized voice stops, okay. So what this suggests is that, um, you know, as we're getting a little bit more of a nasal leakage for that pre-nasalized VLAC, we're also ending up with a more modal voicing pattern. Um, it's facilitating voicing, making it more regular. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so um, really, um, pre okay, so this is just a summary. Pre-nasalization gives more energy, especially for velas, in particular, boosts the energy above 350 hertz, um, bringing it more in line with nasal phonemes proper. The CPP results, that sort of special harmonic to noise ratio measure, also further the pre-nasalized vela patterns more with the nasal phonemes, and that suggests a concomitant more modal voice quality for these sounds as compared to regular voice stops. Um, and for strength of excitation, the pre-nasalization patterns between the voice stops and the nasals and velas may have a lower strength of excitation in general. So, um, so you know, really this pre-nasalization is about maintaining voicing when you need to have a very long um, closure duration. Um, and so, um, and it, it's particularly relevant for vela uh, place of articulation because that's the one where voicing is going to cease the soonest. So, um, you know, you could say, yeah, so whereas it's easier to keep voicing going for the bilabial place of articulation, just purely, you know, um, to do with the uh, aerodynamics of uh, yeah, maintaining pressure below the glottis and above the glottis and so on and so forth. Sorry. Um, okay. And so you could suggest that pre nasalization may have been borrowed into carquette. Um, in order to maintain voicing, in particular for the vela. Okay, so it's a borrowed feature. It's not, um, yeah, so that's the main thing I really wanted to say about that. Um, that's pretty much the end of the content part of the talk. Um, but I just wanted to do a little bit of a blurb. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, Adele mentioned that I'm the editor of the um, Journal of the International Phonetic Association. And this issue, the December issue, which surely must be online any time now, uh, it wasn't when I checked this morning, but it must be soon, uh, is our 50th anniversary issue. Um, it's very exciting. Um, although it's 50 years under the title JIPA, it's actually 134 years um, as a continuous journal. It was previously Le Maître Phonétique and uh, the English teacher, and it was published purely in IPA font for 80 years. Um, they finally gave up on that when they started JIPA in 1971, and it's um, 20 years since we've been with CUP. So um, I mentioned this because when the December issue goes live, there will be a little article written by, um, mostly by Michael Ashby and I wrote one paragraph. Um, it's a history, it's only four pages or something, a history of the journal. I found it very interesting reading learning um, how a journal was built up and everything that went on in the past. So um, I just refer you to that special issue when it comes out. Um, otherwise, these are some references that I just mentioned in the talk, apart from my software references. And um, otherwise, I will say thank you very much for listening. Okay, I hope to hear your feedback. Yeah. <coughs> If I can just say one thing, uh, Maria, that was so much fun. That was just such a such a fun talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> Best compliment I've had, I think. <laughs> <coughs> Questions? I 
hope. Um, well, something that um, struck a chord with me early on was your discussion between of the possible difference or lack of difference between a, if you like, a phonemic schwa-like vowel and some kind of um, schwa that is either an inserted vowel or doesn't have the same phonemic status and whether these are similar or not. And I, I've seen a number of these things um, uh, across the um, languages of Northeast India where they will have a, a vowel <clears throat> that is the, you know, in a consonant, consonant sequence um, in a lexical item that is clearly very close to the schwa, but is clearly a full phoneme versus um, uh, like prefixes that don't behave in the same way. And community moves backwards and forwards about whether they want to treat these the same or differently. So th this phenomenon would appear to be something that's quite um, um, more widely um, found, if, that's, if I've understood correctly what you- I think it's not unusual. Yep. Yeah, and it's interesting. People tell me that sometimes they, they can hear, speakers can hear these sounds, but it's interesting you say they move backwards and forwards as to whether they want to label them as a phony. As it, I, by that I mean, I assume, put it in the orthography. Well, yeah. well, as w whether they want to treat them as being the same thing. So, yeah. um, well, What's tricky about carquette is that there is this phonemic schwa, and Look, Berger talks yeah. about the more complicated historical situation. But here, because schwa's, even phonemic schwa's are very short, um, and so there is overlap in duration. In those other languages, like the talks of ALS, you've got a clear duration difference where the phonemic vowels are longer and the um, excreasing vowels are shorter. So that's easy. But a phonemic schwa is a short sound no matter what. Exactly. So um, that's what's tricky here. Yeah. But I would love to get speakers to count syllables. And Stephen, do you have any intuition whether your speakers can count the syllables and what they do? Oh, uh, well, so here we'd be dealing with um, examples of what in the Sino-Tibetan area is called the sesquisyllable. Sesquisyllable, yeah. The one and a half syllables. And so you get something like um, tray. So the question is, is, is this uh in tray? the same as the uh in a word like hai, which um, is, a, uh, is not an example of that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky because if you have this idea of one and a half syllables, well, then it's going to be intrinsically difficult for speakers to count syllables because defining syllables is already problematic because you've got this idea of a half syllable. So yeah. I think this is really one to the psycholinguists, you know. Yeah. The phoneticians are quite comfortable with <laughs> talking about open transitions and <laughs> which doesn't phase us. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah. Who's moderating the question, Stephen? Because there's one in the chat. Okay, well, let's... Um, uh, so, Dan, Dan, are you unmuted? Do you want to ask the question or do you want... Okay, I'll oh. ask, uh, you say that Q is the most back consonant. Is it more back than K and G? Aren't they classified as the same, or as <laughs> in Bila? Um, well, the point is that they're varying. They're really varying. Um, in, in Karket, it's just, it really is back and forth. Um, so I, do, I wouldn't want to put a place on it. So that's why I was calling it Q. I wouldn't want to put a place and call it the Vila. I wouldn't want to put a place and, you know, yeah, and interestingly, um, years ago, Andy Butcher and I did some work on velar consonants in Australian mm -hmm. Aboriginal languages. And um, there we found that it was consistently more back in environments where in Australian English, you know, you could show a bit more variability. Oh, in English, sorry, it's pretty huge probably. Um, um, and we suggested that it was more back precisely in order to avoid the crowded coronal consonant space. Um, you know, level out those form and transitions, make sure there were no form and transitions that were looking a little bit too much like um, coronal consonant transitions. So, yeah. So I think we're dealing with a completely different kettle of fish, mm, so to speak. 
I have another question. You, you said the pre-nasalization is a characteristic of oceanic languages. Um, Anemic pre-nasalization, yep. Uh, it's also quite common, I believe, in um, um, Austronesian languages, such as uh, varieties of Malay. I wonder how it's different. I, I'm sure it is different, but I'm not quite sure. For example, Du Sun has some uh, pre-nasalization, but it probably is different. I wonder if you can, uh, do you know, I don't know if you know enough about that, if you can, um, if you're able to uh, compare that. You, um, no, but I would be wanting to have a good look at pre-nasalized stocks in okay. any language. Am I able to share my screen? If I can share my screen, I can actually... Yep. I'll, I'll actually stop my share. share. Yeah, sure. Is that possible to do it? So yeah, Stephen, did you want to keep recording or just not bother? Just stop now? You know, I think you have to stop. Okay, so you have to stop sharing your screen. Now I'll I share my that. screen. Yep. See if that'll work. Okay. Uh, let me see.